Hi, I'm James Just, and this is Libertarian Counterpoint. With me tonight is Michael Warnkin, a Libertarian activist, and Jason Quintaro, the chairman out of Solano County Libertarian Party. So today, let's talk about Proper 13 shenanigans, the split role property tax. Is it an assault on families? Uh, well, I think constantly rising prices and inflation of almost any case is uh, kind of an assault on everybody. But uh, I think what's going on is um, the state of California, which seems to be perpetually broke, is trying to find more money. And the way to do that, and they've attacked Prop 13, which we all know keeps, you know, tries to hold our property taxes down. Um, the newest assault on it is to say, okay, well, fine, we're not going to try and, you know, take Prop 13 away from the residential. But what we're going to do is go after all those people with, you know, businesses, those rich people who own mm. houses. Yeah. So, uh, is it shenanigans? Uh, well, it's certainly a form of shenanigans, that's for sure. So what happens when we attack all the businesses, all the businesses that produce profits and bring in tax revenue? What happens then? Well, they, they pay for things, right? And they, and they, and they hold everything up, right. right? And then they get pissed off and they move out of state. Yeah. Right? So is this a good idea? I don't think so. Reminds me of when they raised, the, what was the half cent sales tax statewide, and they found that it disproportionately fell on car dealerships. And you know what happened immediately thereafter? <laughs> we lost half of our car dealerships and they didn't get the extra revenue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they say they're always broke, but they're always broke because they're constantly spending more and more money on various political projects, not necessarily on fixing the roads and the things we all agree on. It's political spending. Yeah. And okay. is, is, so that's kind of the assault on families. Is, well, you know, uh, you know, a government that's constantly consuming and, and doesn't have much restraint is uh, is sort of that. And I mean, I think there's plenty of examples throughout history. So, and and right now it looks like you know Prop 13 is you know they've tried to attack Prop 13 a number of times over the years, and too many people, including them, you know, mm -hmm. them themselves want to keep it. And so they said, all right, well let's let's go after half of it. And uh, I think the last thing I saw a poll said that. Uh, that people aren't really for that. So, I mean, I think uh, I think they feel that the government's gone to the well too many times, you know. I mean, number of communities and cities that have had, you know, this local sales tax or everything else uh, picked up and and I think uh, too many people are feeling like they're crying uh, crying wolf. So, well, the original prop part of prop 13 was to keep essentially old people in their homes and in their businesses. So, family businesses, family farms can continue to get passed on to generations. Is and is that Kind of the assault is why are why are our elected representatives continually assaulting this the family I call it the family safety net is the families can build their own safety net so they don't have to rely on the government so why is this assault continually going on I think it's because we have a one party system in California the Democrats own everything and the media tells the people you have to vote Democrat or else well, I don't know what that or else is but people keep voting for the same people over and over and over again. So as long as we have a one-party system and people keep voting for that same party, they can do whatever they want. And you, when you and when you say a one-party system, I mean obviously there's 20% uh, of the legislature in each chamber are, are Republicans. But 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 what you're saying is one party controls enough to shut the other party down completely. So right, yeah. yeah. Republicans have no juice. They have nothing going on. Yeah. Now libertarians are still trying. We're still trying. So. And well, and as a libertarian activist here in in town. I try to contact my own local representatives, and they don't respond to me, even as, as a libertarian vice chairman here in town, or just as an average citizen who's you know being attacked by the AB5 or whatever bills they're working on now. I want to sit down and have a discussion. They don't mm -hmm. listen to me, but yet their union buddies can get you know any minute they want. Right, yeah. you don't matter. Yeah. yeah, so we don't matter. And so talking about you know family farms, market manipulation failures. Government farm intervention is killing both big and small farms. This is one of the odd things we've, we're talking about. I think Dean Foods filed for bankruptcy recently. They're one of the largest... Uh, what do they uh, make? Oh, they're, they're just a big conglomerate, farm conglomerate. Makes, I think mostly they're in meats, but, okay. I, but they're meats and dairy, dairy. They're mostly dairy, meats and dairy. And then the small farms, false family farms are are closing and are going out of business at an exceeding rate. Is this huh. market manipulation failures? They're kind of hurting both ends. Well, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, I can't say what's uh, what what they're being hit with most. I mean, is, is it you know usually they're you know usually the government whether it's Congress or a state will put a, put a law forward and you know that obviously has effects. But what we find in this day and age, it's the administrative state. You know, uh, you know, so any of the alphabet soup, right, EPA or something like that. So in this case, I guess you know it could be the Federal Food and Drug or or um, you know something like that. And 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 so you know I, I go back to uh, Obamacare. 
in that lawsuit when it hit the Supreme Court, half of what they were talking about was called the Administrative Procedures Act. And what it is is Congress or a state legislature will write a law allowing these agencies to make their own laws. So what'll happen is, you know, so you, you're talking about these farms and they're probably getting hit by, oh, you know, you know, who knows what statute. But it, a lot of times it's not even the legislatures who's passing it. It's all these, you know, these rigid agencies that we create, again, alphabet soup agencies, you know, EPA, IRS, you know, all of them that have their own law writing rules. And then all of a sudden you not only have to be prosecuted by them, but then you've got to dance to their tune when they change the law. So, I mean, that's a, that is a fundamental flaw in our government system and, and it's hammering the heck out of people. In this case, you're saying, Family farms or large farms. Family farms. Everybody, everybody getting whacked. And is it the kind of just not that there's just one law or a handful of laws, it's that there's this never ending avalanche right. of laws that never yeah. ends, it never stops, and the complexity is just for yeah. a family farm, even if a family farm can't do it and a large farm can't manage this, yeah. how are we supposed to manage this in our daily yeah. life? Right. Well, and the big corporate farms, they have the lawyers, they have the money, they can yeah. they can handle this deluge of rules and regulations. Well, the family farm just can't. Yeah. That's not fair. Yeah, it really it really bothers me. Uh, regulation, you know, regulation. Un the people didn't vote on these like, regulations. Yeah, these agencies were just given authority to do it. Yeah, and well, it, it, they're the bureaucracy, so to speak. And and if you break out the word bureaucracy, it means literally a government of desks. Yeah, the bureaus. <laughs> a whole bunch. Yeah, a whole bunch of desks. Bunch. And these people aren't elected. They're appointed. Sometimes they're given these spots because they were termed out somewhere. I, I, in California, I, I cranked it out to about 560. And this, you know, I, I don't know how close that is, but there's about 560 boards. They're anywhere from three to 11 people. They get paid 100 to 200,000 a year to sit on them. You know, EPA, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the Air, Air, ARB. You know, I mean, just the amount of power they have. And you go to your rep, I mean, first well, you got the first problem. If you're talking to a Republican, forget it, right? And if right. you're talking to a Democrat, they'll say, you know, I, I can't do anything. It's that agency, right? Right. Now, those three people had to make all the decisions for me. What yeah. are you talking about? It's yeah. insane. Yeah, and, and one of the problems is is that they have a, they've got this institutional um, culture where their, their job is to go in and look for problems. Yeah. And so that's what they constantly do, even when they're done, right? Even when they theoretically can be done. Okay, we're the referee. We, we know how to kind of play the referee in this thing. So we can actually don't need to pass more laws. Yeah. We just need to kind of manage the laws we already have. But there's not a culture of that. The culture is, well, we've got to do more. We've got to do more so we yeah. can justify a bigger budget. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what a lot of this comes down to um, uh, is the restraint that any of these individuals have. And, and they really don't have any. Uh, the restraint tends to be, and this is on the opposite equation we were talking about earlier, is how much money they have. You know, really, I mean, I mean, right. these agencies, there's, you know, no one in the legislature. I mean, one of the main duties of the legislature is to investigate, you know, these agencies and, and, and the judges and, the, and everything within the state. But since there's only 40 and 80, what they do is they watch over however few. And, and really, it comes down to, you know, how, how, you know, how ballsy these guys are and how much they want to go for. So, yeah. anyway. Well, yeah. One of the things I've said is one of the jobs of a representative is actually oversight. It's not actually to pass new laws. It's actually to oversight of the bureaucracy to make sure the bureaucracy stays in its lane. And that is something that our current legislature has clearly yeah, well, the, the, the theory in American politics, you know, as opposed to anywhere else in the world, we, we add taxation with representation, right? You know, and the idea is you don't just pay taxes because you have representatives, but the idea is if you're paying taxes, the, the money's going to the right place, it's not being misspent, it's not being used, and so much for having a legislature because they're certainly not doing that. So. <laughs> so let's talk about unintended consequences. People and millennials are fleeing left-wing states. Are they going to take their problems with, this, with them, Jason? <laughs> hey, they're definitely going to take their problems with them and, and pawn them off to someone else. That's the way I see it. Um, I, I hate to say millennials because, I mean, millennial encompasses people of all kinds of different uh, political views or incomes. But why are they fleeing the left-wing states? I don't know. I mean, I haven't done the research on why. But, I mean, well, I, I, is it just a money thing or is well, it a no, no, politics I, thing? I, I, think the, I think the article, you know, from The Federalist, which is obviously a more, you know, conservative uh, publication is, you know, they're basically taking the stance that, okay, you know, you made your bed sleep in it. And they're saying, well, yeah, we, we voted for all this stuff. And now that it's bad, get the heck out. And then when they get to their new place, and I've seen this, you know, a lot of places in Facebook and so forth, you know, that, that all these new blue voters are flowing to these other places. And they're not yeah. even saying to themselves, you know, you know, it's those things you voted for over here that pushed you right. to come over here. And now that you're over here, here or back to it, you didn't seem to learn from what you put over there. But right. I know plenty of people and I have plenty of friends who are so mad at the government, so pissed off that it's so expensive, the roads are crap, they're so mad, but I see them vote Democrat over and over and over again. I think, well, this is your fault. Yeah. And, and 
And sometimes I want to say, don't blame the, the politician. Stop blaming the politician. But I blame you, my friends, who are out there voting Democrat over and over again. It's your fault. And don't get pissed off when you get no services. Yeah. When you get shitty roads. Sorry, can I say that? But don't do that. <laughs> no, you can't, but we can believe it. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and then, you know, be careful for what you wish for. So you ask government to do something. And, you know, when you, when you have a, you know, if you have a business, if they don't do a good enough job washing your car, you don't go back to them. And unfortunately, uh, you know, government has a monopoly. So when you, once you give uh, government the power to oversee the EPA, you know, the IRS, guess what? Yeah. And are they already taking their problems of gentrification with them? I was reading an article about people in Boise who are upset oh, about yeah. Californians. They sell their million and a half dollar home in, you know, that's a shack. Yeah. That's a shack in San Francisco. They move to Boise and buy a four hundred thousand dollar home with cash. Yeah. And so they're they're kind of distorting yeah. the market. And this kind of thing is fine if it's a trickle, right? It doesn't really distort the market. But when it's a flood, then it then it starts distorting the market, and the the local economy can't afford four hundred thousand dollar homes. It's like it happened in my neighborhood. The poor well, people in my neighborhood can't afford four hundred thousand dollar homes. Yeah, but that's mean, what they're selling for. When you're going, you know, so what you're talking about, you know, is gentrification. It's I think it's a little bit different than that. But but yeah, when when people sell their house in California and go to these other places, they start inflating the market. For the people who are owners there, uh, you got two sides. One, you got people perhaps you don't want there, you know, with beliefs and voting that you may not want. But it, you know. And, and at the same time, you know, you know, part of the U.S. Constitution, you have a right to travel, and and so we didn't, you know, in England, that's weird. <laughs> There's certain places you can't go because they won't let you in unless you go there. We did away with that. Um, but you know, I, I certainly can sympathize with people for you know we're inflating the market in other places, and you know if they don't like you know the certain blue voters that we've built here, you know those people who want to you know vote for what they put in place, and then uh, and then when what they voted to put in place didn't work, then they go somewhere else, you know, and then they started new. So. Yeah, it's just distorting the housing market here in California, and then you're going to take that same process, thought process, and go distort the, the housing markets in, elsewhere. In, uh, elsewhere. It seems to me that we haven't thought of that the basic problem is a distorted housing market. Yeah. That right. that's what we actually need to, to kind, of, kind of look at. Yeah. So, well, let's move on to a different subject. Um, the right to repair. Uh, it's a growing issue with Tesla and Apple products specifically, but as, <laughs> um, as, this, as our technology grows on and becomes more and more sophisticated, you have these internal programs. How much right to repair your own car or your own Apple product should you actually have? Uh, well, I'll jump into it. I mean, it, it's kind of a contractual aspect. Uh, you know, if you sell me that pen, you know, between you and me and I give you a dollar for it, I can pretty much do whatever the heck I want with the pen. However, if you sell it to me with certain stipulations, you know, I, I guess in real estate they call them CCNRs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you can limit what I can do with it in theory. Um, Tesla sort of almost has, uh, you know, residual ownership of the car uh, when they sell it to you with the understanding that, you know, you know, perhaps if you go to work on it, you might break it. Or even yet, there may be another aspect where you all of a sudden discover, you know, the trade secrets that they have. So, you know, from that aspect, you know, libertarians tend to be very pro contractual aspect you know we're, mm -hmm. we're anti-government make a contract between the two people engaged uh, so I think I think from that standpoint uh, you know from the contract standpoint it makes sense but libertarians are tend to be leave me alone let me do what the heck you know in fact they would like the opportunity to to have the contract so they can say no to the contract and yeah. <laughs> well no other auto manufacturer gets this it gets this privilege right if you buy a Ford you can go take it home and fix it yourself I mean, so can you should you, shouldn't you be able to do the same thing with a well with a Tesla? Yeah, that's up to you, consumer. You know, it's up to the consumer. If the consumer wants to buy the new electric Ford pickup in 2021 or whatever that thing comes out, instead of a Tesla, for that reason, well then Ford wins. Ford sells more vehicles. Uh, it's up to the consumer. But is the consumer I, I, actually getting a choice? Is that actually the question? Now, in states like Massachusetts, they have a right to repair, and so Tesla actually has to kind of support Let you them, do it there. Let you do it there. And so there's... Oh, really? In, in, in Massachusetts and I think New Jersey is... Yeah, is, I, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if a state did that. So what they're basically doing is saying that their state legislature overrode contractual rights, saying that, that all, all contracts having to do with this thing will run. And, and, and I guess the other thing is, is like... Uh, 
uh, so so uh, Apple's the other example, and they're and they're you know whenever the newest iPhone comes out, you know I, you know, I don't even know what we're up to iPhone 12. We'll say that right. Yes, so yeah. what'll happen is if you have an iPhone 11, you know all of a sudden it doesn't work as fast, and 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 they've got their own answer. They'll say, well, it's uh, uh, I forget what it is. It's on some repair band or something like that. And some people are like, well, they just get in, they fool with it, and they're back up to speed. Well, Apple just lost that sale. Yeah. Well, Apple's even worse. It's they take used up. People will take a used phone, take it apart and want to resell the, uh -huh. the, the components to, to people who fix Apple phones and like resell mm -hmm. the screens and so they're actual Apple parts but they use, Apple uses the customs agency to prevent that from happening. Oh wow, I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. So because you know these chi companies in China or Taiwan will sit here and they'll recycle Apple phones and then they'll want to resell all the parts to, to so people can repair old Apple phones but you can't import those into America because Apple is using the customs agency to prevent that. So it's Apple is actually using the, the government, government to prevent people from repairing their own devices for much cheaper than Apple will. And Apple claims they can't make money on repair. So make make a I'll note of that, that next time you consider buying an Apple product. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Samsung, so I'm not worried about it. There no. you go. Well, I have to buy. We'll I work with my phone, so I have to buy something that's a little more sturdy than Apple's. If you drop an Apple phone, they have a it's his, toast, huh? They have a breaking. So I have to buy myself a, a motor. I buy a Motorola. It's the only reason is because it's almost indestructible. It's the only reason I buy it. The you company. You drop things a lot. Yeah. Oh, I drop it a lot. I work with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> and well. But the, the worst, it's the absolute worst customer service on the planet is Motorola. So don't actually buy their phones unless you don't want to break it. Because the customer service is the worst. We're clearly not getting money from Motorola or, or Apple. Yeah. <laughs> no. They will not be donating to the Libertarian Party. I won't we'll be expecting that check. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a couple more things. Political control of energy. We've had an issue in New York where they had, where... Cuomo was restricting the ability of a gas company to bring more gas into the into New York, while at the same time not letting them restrict new customers. So essentially, they're creating a situation where you can't bring extra gas in, but you have to still have to hook up extra customers that you're not going to have enough gas to service. Yeah. So you're driving the prices up, basically. Yeah, deliberately driving the prices up, and now just. It's what uh, well, I guess it will be a couple weeks ago now. Gavin Newsom rejected a bankruptcy deal for PG&E to get to get the those fires paid yeah. for. The fires paid for. It, I, it's a little bit confusing. And um, but the political control of energy is that actually a good idea? Where you have these politicians making these basic energy decisions? Well, I don't know. You have to ask Gavin and his uh, donors from PG&E. Yes. It's funny because I, when I heard that Gavin said no to their bankruptcy, I'm thinking, okay, who's calling who behind the scenes? You know what I mean? And what's the deals that are made? It, it's, it's, um, I hate to hear government get involved in private industry. But when it comes to PG and E, this monopoly—can I say monopoly? I don't know. Is it? Yeah, a no, it's ab no, it's absolutely monopoly. You know, it absolutely. seems like a monopoly to me. As a it's, it's, it's a government basically set up monopoly. It's the government that allows that monopoly to exist. Right. Yeah. And as a libertarian, I want to let the free market work, but we, it can't work if pg and &E owns everything. So well, what you were stance. What you were talking about a, a minute ago, so the number of consumers goes up, but the amount of gas doesn't come in. So obviously that means more people are part of the marketplace, which drives prices up. And that's what monopolies do. They raise prices. I mean, uh, you know, it's not basic economics, but well, within economics, you know, your first few years in college economics where they talk about a monopoly will produce less and they'll raise prices. You know, well, guess what? That's what right. we got. And, and, and those people who are active in a monopoly, they will continue to protect that. And no question, you know, they're obviously funding money, you know, funding yeah. a lot of these campaigns. So, so when you see a crisis like it is, and obviously if they were competitive, they would have been keeping their, keeping their wires up to date and fixing things and stuff like mm -hmm. that, which they weren't doing. Now that there's a catastrophe, the people that they've uh, given money to who've obviously run and gotten office with it have to, you know, play, and I would I call this a charade. This is a charade. A charade is a PR game. Yeah. You're playing games with voters. Again. Yeah, and they're, again. And they're saying, we're not going to accept this deal. Well, yeah, okay, well, you know, and, and in the meantime, we got one producer of a product, and, 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 and they're going to raise our rates to pay for the bad actions they're doing. Right? No, I'm making it up, right? You right, know, no, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, and here in California, this whole system is actually created by, by politicians. If you yeah. go back to the original deregulation, which caused the whole Enron problem, which then they re-reg, which actually wasn't deregulation. Yeah, it no, was, no, it was only partial deregulation. Because yeah. you can't have more regulations than you had before and call it deregulation. Yeah. So that's, you can't do that. And so it was actually a re-regulation, which caused the Enron scandal, which then created this whole new scheme that they made 
PG&E diversify itself from their, their transmission business and their power production business. And so it set up this whole condition yeah. that, that created this. And we don't even talk about that. Yeah. We don't talk about how this was, whole system was created by politicians interfering in the electrical market to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get more hands in there, you make it more confusing. Yeah. It just Well, no, that's the thing. You know. I think most modern problems are a lot more simple than we think they are. It's 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 that, you know, there's always this morass you have to drive through and everybody just looks at it from the standpoint, I can't figure this out. But I think part of the game is to make things more confusing than they really are. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you make things more complicated, you make things harder for the small guy. Right. And so you just have right. to accept, well, then I need my representative to look out for me because I can't look out for all this. It's far it, too it, complicated. There's far too many moving parts. So yeah. I can't do it myself. So I have to off, offload this to somebody else. And then those people will get to abuse the systems. Yeah. Right. And, and us. And us. And, and they get to make decisions that are not suitable for the whole, for the entire population. They're suitable for their little world goals. So, so the question you ask is, can any good come from this? Well, I mean, if, if the state takes control of it, which, you know, there's state, uh, state run and state managed government uh, utilities. I mean, like, you know, Mexico has Pemex, Pemex or whatever. I mean, well, you know, if you, if you manage it and it blows up, the legislature has to own it. You know, who, you know, it's one thing if they're sitting on the outside and and, uh, and and they're you know complaining about things. And so if they want to take control of it, you know, the next the next fire is on the legislature. It's you know right now they can say it's you know they can pin it on uh, PG&E, but you know. Well, if you think customer service is bad now with PG&E, oh yeah, you know, so yeah. Wait till the government owns it. Yeah. And see how bad. Well, that yeah. Is. Talk to your cable company. See how well that runs. Right. Well, we right. have a, yeah. here in right. Sacramento. Here in Sacramento, we have SMUD, a, a municipal utility district, and it's fairly well run now but i remember as a child there was always constant problems with it there was constant complaints about how it was it could corrupt or, or incompetently run or very it, and so even if it's run well now it doesn't mean it's going to be run well in the future and changing a government system is much harder than changing yeah. a than changing a free market system yeah mm -hmm. so back down to the changing government system the copper rules to protect children have content creators confused and worried but this is mostly on youtube content us youtube content creators okay and for those who focus on, you know, it's for those who focus on children, but if you have, the rules are so loosely defined, if you use cartoon characters, you might be defined as advertising to children and you can have your your um, economics taken away. The, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I guess YouTube's an important, YouTube's an important thing because obviously, I mean, so, you know, we're in the Sacramento market, you know, and, and for everybody who's around here, you get to turn the dial only so many times, whereas in YouTube, Everybody, you know, we've got the same storefront, so to speak. Uh, and it's like the Wild West, where you can make just about anything you want, other than the fact that the reality is you can't make everything you want. Uh, yeah, I think we want protection for our kids. Yeah, we want content creators, and there's going to be some problems in that, no matter how you shake it out. Well, what's the restriction? We're talking about like nudity on YouTube? Well, it's, it's, it's advertising to kids. It's about advertising okay. to kids. It's, it's, and so you don't want to have content that, is, that can theoretically manipulate children to buy some product. But it's, it's so vaguely written. It sounds vague. It sounds and it's vague. so vaguely written. And so you have, you've got you know, the people who make shows like Baby Shark, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They're actually going to end up falling under this thing as well. Yeah, but I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, I grew up watching, you know, Saturday morning cartoons, right? You know, and, and guess what? They sold Play-Doh at, at the, at the, you know, during the commercial. So I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure how this can even work. Do we actually need government protecting our children or do we have enough tools as individuals now where I can actually protect my own child? I, I can set controls. You know, I actually never put any controls on my child, children. I let them watch whatever they wanted. And they kind of, that kind of, it took care of itself it, well, in, the, in the long run. As long as they don't have Dora the Explorer doing porn, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> I, don't know. I guess that's possible. <laughs> it's possible. It's, I mean, I don't want to think about it, man. It's nasty. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you raise your children to make, to make good choices, and sometimes they'll make bad ones, but then they learn that that's a bad choice, and then so they start making the right ones. You know, my, my philosophy of raising children is child is, is for practice. And so you have to give them the freedom to practice, the freedom to fail, and so they can, they can learn to be better as they grow up. And that was kind of all my hope as, as raising children. And this kind of a COPPA thing is going, I'm having politicians, again, interjecting themselves in my relationship with my children and my community, rather than just letting us decide for ourselves and get out of my way. I can kind of understand that you... Yeah, and, and, and not only that, the interpretation, you know, there's a famous case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court and they, and they said, well, what's, you know, what, what's, you know, 
profanity and what's uh, you know yeah. what what's over overtly offensive. And one judge just famously said, "Well, I can't really say, but I know it when I see it." Right. Yeah, and and so yeah. you know, so guess what? They're doing this now, and we're having the same problem as to what the parameters are, right? You know, so. Yeah, I prefer to let me decide. I'll decide what my yeah. kids can see and not see. I'm good with that. I mean, I don't let my, my kids watch CNN because it's disgusting. <laughs> so that's my choice. It's my choice. Well, see, I let my kids watch CNN if they want. MS, they can even watch MSNBC, except I don't pay a cable bill. So <laughs> <laughs> they, have to, they have to get all their information from the Internet. And YouTube. And YouTube and, and Facebook. And so speaking of YouTube and Facebook, with all these, with all the consternation that's been going around these days with we're talking about whether it's political consternation impeachment or whether it's talking about um, future election interference or what is the role that these social media companies should actually play in our life in our daily lives you know should Facebook actually have such a you know it's not let's not, not talk about government should get in the way just like should we as individuals step back from these social media networks should we reconnect with our government uh, with our communities, not government, at a more local level. Well, for me, I see Facebook being used to unite communities. You know, I saw that um, in Vacaville, California, there's a politician and his wife trying to create tiny sheds for homeless people, but there's no water, no electricity. They're trying to put sheds in there, and I'm trying to follow the money, but it's, it sounds dirty, very dirty. But campaigns have been built on Facebook to fight against the government putting homeless people in their neighborhoods. Yeah. The government just wants essentially bus people into their neighborhoods, put them in sheds with no power, no water, no, no nothing. And the neighbors are saying, no, we're not going to do this. And the campaign really grew on Facebook. Yeah. So I'm very thankful for social media. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, I mean, there's, you know, the knife cuts both ways, certainly. Yeah. Um, you know, from one aspect of our ability to communicate, you know, I've met people on Facebook I'd never met had I not had such a platform. Uh, the darker side of it is, gosh, I mean, the amount of data that they're collecting, they, they know who you are by how fast you type. Uh, they know uh, they know what your barometric pressure is, where you're at. When you, I mean, the amount of data that they've collected on all of us and, and can exploit is is uh, is disturbing. So, uh, and then I guess part of the question is is should government treat it as a utility, you know, sort of like you know PG and E, and then you know regulate it? Well, I mean, we can see how good they're doing with uh, PG and right. E. So. Yeah, well, the government regulating <laughs> social media is probably the last. The last thing we want the government to do is regulating our conversations. Yes, no. is, is in no shape or form do I want government regulating my conversations so it's up to all of us to use these tools as tools yeah and and I've heard your conversations so yeah <laughs> yeah so <Be> careful <laughs> <laughs> so with we've got about 20 seconds left so this is about all the time we have I'd like to thank our guests Michael Warnkin and Jason Quintero for, yep. for appearing on the on, on the show for more information on the topics we've discussed, please go to our website, libertariancounterpoint.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit the like, subscribe, and if you would like, the notification buttons. You can lock, And you can also start looking for us on your favorite social media platforms. And from those of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching.